Super Smash Bros. is really a miracle. Upon its release in 1999, it took the world by storm and created the absolute juggernaut franchise that it is today. Never before had a game featured so many star characters, all playable with their unique moves and abilities. Before Super Smash Bros., the biggest crossover in gaming I'd have to say would have to be Marvel vs. Capcom, and even so, Capcom had already had the license for Marvel fighting games, which stuck to the standard Capcom fighting formula, which is a winning formula, of course. The Street Fighter games are absolute classics, as are their other series they took fighters from, like Darkstalkers, but even so, Smash was different. Not only was it a fighting game full of familiar characters, it created a new style for the fighting game genre that, by 1999, generally stuck to the both fighters facing each other at all times style, and having buttons for high and low punches and kicks and blocking and needing to perform specific directional inputs and button presses in order to execute special attacks. Along with a collection of recognizable Nintendo icons, Super Smash Bros. also had unique gameplay where losing a fight didn't consist of any health bar dropping to zero, but whether or not your character could return safely to the stage when hit, as the higher your character's damage percent, the further you'd be sent flying. With this original combat system brought a new style of controlling your character. No longer were you forced to face each other directly, but you could freely roam the stage, face in either direction, dash back and forth, and so on. On top of this, characters also shared all inputs for attacks. The A button performed a regular jab attack, with some characters being able to rapidly punch if tapped repeatedly. The B button performed special attacks, generally stemming from the character's games, except for in certain cases with characters like Captain Falcon or Fox, who have never been seen outside their vehicles, but regardless, this left all characters feeling accessible to a new audience, and that's exactly what creator Masahiro Sakurai wanted. Fighting games, even to this day, always feel like they have an incredibly high skill ceiling. Even just getting okay at them requires a lot of practice, and while I'm by no means undermining the absolute insanity that is high-level Smash play, I think two novice gamers can pick up Super Smash and get a decent understanding of it faster than they would, say, with King of Fighters, but I digress. The Super Smash Bros. Iceberg was something I partially joked about in my Super Mario 64 Iceberg video when I mentioned Rainbow Village, and by the end of that video, I decided it'd be an interesting potential future topic. The Zelda Iceberg seemed to go over quite well, despite my less than accurate pronunciation of things that seemed to make some people angry, but to cover myself for that, when I played Ocarina of Time, I was in second grade or so, and still learning words like Ocarina or how to pronounce words that were made up for a game like Kakariko or Saria. I just did my best, and while it is true I could certainly correct myself, and oftentimes I do say these words the right way, I don't really have an explanation as to why I say it the way I do. It's really kinda just stuck with me, so sorry if that bugs anyone. Anyway, no real big nostalgic backstory intro for this one, rather I just wanted to talk about the history of the franchise real quick, and don't worry, the nostalgic bits will be sprinkled in throughout the iceberg. Also, as you can see, there isn't much on this iceberg as Zelda or Super Mario 64. Originally, I planned to do this other iceberg, however, the points on it were much more obscure, to the point that I didn't understand many of them, so I figured I'd do this one that I do understand. This video will most likely be shorter than my other videos, but I'll still do my best to be comprehensive and in-depth, so grab a snack, get comfy, this is going to be a decently long video. Let's get started. Masahiro Sakurai Masahiro Sakurai is of course the creator of Super Smash Bros. At age 19, he created Kirby while working at HAL Laboratories. In 1998, Sakurai would begin work on a game called Dragon King The Fighting Game, which we'll discuss a bit more later. Shortly into development, feeling the game was lacking in atmosphere, Sakurai retooled the game into what would become Super Smash Bros. Dragon King has its own spot on the list, so I'll go more in depth when we get to that point, so... Uh... More on that later. Subspace Emissary Subspace Emissary was the adventure mode created for Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and in my opinion is absolutely fantastic and seemed like a logical next step in the progression of Super Smash Bros. single-player modes. The first game simply giving a gauntlet of fights to master hand, with of course break the targets and board the platforms and race to the finish in there for a little extra something, then Super Smash Bros. Melee added an adventure mode, which sprinkled in side-scrolling bits through popular locations in the character roster's games, like the Mushroom Kingdom and an underground dungeon influenced by the Zelda franchise, and so on. 
This mode also featured a few very short cutscenes, but even so, it was amazing to see at the time and would only be a taste of what was to come. Brawl's Subspace Emissary wasn't just a mode like the other two games that only took a half hour to burn through. This was meant to be an epic story and certainly feels as such, as casually playing through can easily take a few hours. From what I've seen, standard playthroughs on YouTube that aren't explicitly speedruns seem to take between 4-6 to six hours to complete. To shortly summarize the story, which is actually quite complex, basically an evil entity known as Taboo wants to take pieces of the world of trophies, which is where the Smash characters are from, and use them for his own world, but that's just putting it to the most basic level. We'll discuss it a bit more in depth as we get to other points on the iceberg. Coin Battle Coin Battle was a game mode featured in Super Smash Bros. Melee, Brawl, and Wii U. The goal of these matches is to collect as many coins as possible. All players start with zero coins, and as you or the opponents get hit, coins will scatter around the arena. Once the timer hits zero, whoever has the most coins wins. I personally find coin battle to be a lot of fun and very hectic. It's a shame that you can't play it with 8 players on the Wii U version. That would be insane and wild, and I'd love it. Giga Bowser. Giga Bowser is a unique version of Bowser first introduced in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and also appearing in every game since. Giga Bowser was created by Masahiro Sakurai due to his initial interpretation of Bowser's original appearance as a frenzied, terrifying monster, compared to his more modern appearance that he describes as steadily becoming cuter. So basically Sakurai just wanted a more menacing Bowser. Giga Bowser first appears as a secret boss in Melee's Adventure Mode as well as in Event Match 51 alongside Ganondorf and Mewtwo. In Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Smash 4, Giga Bowser is Bowser's final smash, and you're given complete control over him, whereas attacks are basically Bowser's, just enhanced. However, in Ultimate, this final smash is replaced with an underwhelming crosshair attack, kinda like Dragoon, where Giga Bowser appears in the background of the stage and swipes at any enemies within the crosshair. Cat Picture on the stage Pokemon Stadium 2, when the stage is in its ice form, there's a picture of a cat inside the little shack house looking thing. Originally fans thought this may have been Masahiro Sakurai's cat, but this was debunked, and it's still a mystery to this day whose cat this is. The cat is still present in both Smash 4 on the Wii U and Ultimate's version of the stage, showing where Nintendo's priorities lie, and that is of course a good thing. Smash is for good boys and girls. So, according to a video by Game Explain, Sakurai never said this line and was instead placed in by whoever did the subtitles, though the meaning is still basically the same. In the Fatal Fury stage, many characters from both Fatal Fury, King of Fighters, and more can be seen in the background. However, fan favorite character Mai Shiranui is missing. Sakurai and Nintendo seem very adamant at keeping the rating of Super Smash Bros. as low as possible, and Mai's very revealing outfit is basically a signature of her, so they decided it would be best just to not incorporate her into the game. As of recently, there's been a bit of questioning into whether or not this is really the case, as it appears as though Pyra and Mithra, who are both well-endowed, seem to have jiggle physics. Maybe it just has to do with how much actual skin is showing, who knows. Taboo Taboo is the main antagonist to Super Smash Bros. Brawl. To put it simply, he wants to use his subspace bombs to send locations from one dimension to his own in order to absorb them and increase his own power. Not entirely sure why he's on the iceberg at all, he's really just a generic villain, though some theories do hint to a deeper meaning or having a more symbolic role, same goes for Master Hand, so maybe that's what this is all about, so uh... More on that later. Palutena's Guidance Palutena's Guidance was an easter egg first introduced in Super Smash Bros. 4, and only in the Wii U version, and is an extended character interaction performed similarly to the Fox and Falco easter egg on Corneria in Melee, where you can call Peppy and Slippy. When this easter egg is performed, sprites of Palutena, Pit, and occasionally Viridi from Kid Icarus Uprising will appear and discuss the opponent Pit is currently facing. For DLC characters, Palutena would say that she has no data on that fighter, and in Smash Ultimate, this easter egg remains for all the newcomers, except of course the DLC characters. The only characters that had dialogue changed between Smash 4 and Ultimate are Ganondorf, Ike, Link, Robin, Sheik, Zelda, Me Gunner, and Wario. Stickers 
In Super Smash Bros. Brawl, stickers were items that could be unlocked through various means of gameplay, and can be added to fighters in order to increase certain stats from defense against certain attacks, increased power using certain attacks, increasing item abilities, and much more. Outside of this, their use is pretty limited. You can place them in an album and make collages, but that's about it. Custom Moves in Super Smash Bros. 4, all characters have two additional custom moves that can replace Neutral B, Side B, Up B, and Down B, in addition to their standard special attacks. These custom moves were removed in Smash Ultimate, but are still accessible for Mii Fighters, since they're meant to be customizable anyway. Zero. Zero is a now-retired professional player who, during his career, was considered the best Smash Bros. for Wii U player in the world, as well as being a top-ranked Brawl and Project M player. He was primarily known for his 56 consecutive tournament win streak, and he would later leave the scene due to some high-profile Smash Bros. competitive scene controversy that would occur in July of 2020. Xander Mobis Xander Mobis is the voice behind the announcer in Smash 4 and Ultimate, as well as the voice of Master Hand, Crazy Hand, and Joker in the three titles he's worked on so far, if you count 3DS Wii U as two different games that is, which I do. He's also done a lot of voice work for many different anime series, as well as other video games. Street Smash Street Smash is a mode exclusive to Smash Bros. for 3DS, utilizing the Street Pass function. As you travel within proximity of other 3DS owners that have Street Pass active, your 3DS will gather their Street Pass info, as theirs will with yours. Once you gather enough Street Pass players, maxing out at 12 total fighters, you can play a mini game, which of course is called Street Smash. In the game, you play as a little coin top looking thing, and the objective is to slam into the other coins and knock them off the edge, so I guess it's kind of like Beyblade meets Super Smash or something. Crazy Hand. Introduced in Melee and appearing in all future titles, Crazy Hand is the left-handed counterpart of Master Hand. His movements are much more wild and chaotic, as is are his attacks, though they're still quite similar. He is said to be the destructive, chaotic counterpart to Master Hand's creative control. There really isn't a whole lot to say about him though, to be honest, so moving on. Rage Rage is a mechanic that was first introduced in Super Smash Bros. 4 and is also present in Ultimate. When a player has a certain percentage of damage, they'll have a slight red flashing effect as well as steam emanating from their body. In Smash 4, this effect starts at 100% and caps at 150%, and in Smash Ultimate the effect starts at 35% and caps at 150%, but is notably nerfed from its Smash 4 counterpart. During Rage, characters' attacks will have increased knockback, though damage output from moves isn't itself increased. Fighters Pass Volume 1 and 2 The Fighters Pass is the name given to the DLC characters added to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Fighters Pass 1 included Joker, Hero, Banjo and Kazooie, Terry, and Byleth to the game, and Fighters Pass 2 has so far introduced Min Min, Steve, Sephiroth, and Pyra and Mithra, with two more fighters coming in the future, and hopefully the announcement of a third Fighters Pass. Hashtag Free Melee Free Melee is a hashtag campaign started against Nintendo who, for whatever reason, sent cease and desist letters to The Big House. The Big House is a group that organizes Super Smash Bros. Melee tournaments online using a program called Slippy that allows for the game to be played online, something that of course wasn't possible in the original GameCube release. In The Big House's letter announcing the shutdown, they say that it was done primarily due to the usage of Slippy, which is strange. I assume because it somehow alters something, probably with some end user license agreement kind of bull, but who knows. Apparently this isn't the first time this has happened, as back in 2010, Nintendo denied MLG the rights to stream Brawl, which basically destroyed its legitimacy as a hardcore game in the eyes of the competitive scene, and the fight to save Smash has resulted in hashtag free melee becoming, well, hashtag save Smash. Fan-made newcomer requirements. It's become theorized that there are certain criteria that must be met in order for a character to be chosen to be in a Smash game. This criteria being that the character must be originally from a video game and they cannot already be an assist trophy, me costume, or a Pokemon in a Pokeball, so there goes my hopes for Shadow. 
Apparently the only real criteria from Nintendo that has been confirmed is that yes, the character must indeed be originally from a video game, but the others haven't been confirmed. Dragon King The Fighting Game so as I had mentioned in the introduction, Dragon King the fighting game was the precursor to what would become Super Smash Bros. Masahiro Sakurai at the time was frustrated by the fact that fighting games had a very high skill ceiling and for casuals to get involved with them was near impossible without putting in countless hours. This of course would eventually happen in Smash 2, much to Sakurai's dismay, as he's gone on record saying that he dislikes the implementation of wave dashing and other techniques found by hardcore fans of the game to get an edge over those who are more casual, creating the gap Sakurai was trying to avoid. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sakurai started development on this fighting game that would be easy for anyone to pick up and play. After a while, however, he grew to feel that the generic characters and world he had created was too plain and too lacking in atmosphere. Without the consent of Nintendo, Sakurai added a couple Nintendo characters in. Loving the idea, but worried of what Nintendo would think of their star characters beating the pulp out of each other, he was hesitant to show it off, but eventually did. The idea was loved, and of course would become the Super Smash Bros. franchise that we know and love today. Meta Crystal. Meta Crystal is a stage in Super Smash Bros. on the Nintendo 64 that is only playable during single player in the fight against Metal Mario. To this day, it's the only Smash 64 stage that has never been remade or playable officially in future titles, and the only way to access it outside single player mode in the Nintendo 64 game would be with a Game Shark. Black Hole Glitch The Black Hole Glitch is a fun glitch in Melee where you have one player playing Fox or Falco, another player playing Fox or Falco, one playing Peach, and the fourth player playing any other character. Note, one Fox or Falco must be on the same team as the character with the Super Scope, with Friendly Fire off. The character with the Super Scope then fires past their teammate who has the reflector activated at the other Fox or Falco, who will also have his reflector activated. The projectiles will then proceed to rapidly bounce back and forth between the reflectors. During this time, the character playing Peach, who also needs to be on their own team by themselves, must throw turnips in the middle of this barrage in order to create the black hole. Though it is possible to crash your game, if you've done it right, you will have created a mash of turnips that, if touched, will do crazy amounts of damage, and more often than not will instantly KO you. If I missed anything about this glitch, sorry, as I've never personally done it, but plenty of great videos show how it's done, so please check those out if you're curious. Daisy Trophy Third Eye A quick and easy one, this is referring to the Daisy Trophy in Super Smash Bros. Melee having a third eye within the model if you zoom in correctly. What I personally find even more strange is that Nintendo went out of their way to patch this out of later versions of the game. Like, I've always understood fixing glitches and bugs, and I guess technically that's what this is, but it's just so obscure. Like, did someone at Nintendo really notice it was there, or did they hear about it from another source? Either way, it's a fun little secret. Moving on. Wave Dashing Wave dashing is an advanced technique in Melee, where if you jump, then immediately air dodge diagonally left or right and down at the same time, if done correctly, your character will appear to slide around on the floor. This allows for much more advanced movement options, such as creating spacing without your character turning around, and much more. While wave dashing does technically exist in Smash Ultimate, it's much less useful and therefore isn't used competitively anywhere near as much as it was in Melee. Melee was rushed. From what's been said on record, Melee was developed in only 13 months, which is absolutely insane. The reason for this tight window was to ensure the game released during the holiday season, so of course it had to do with money. Sakurai would call his life during this development destructive, taking virtually no time off and working tirelessly on the game. He's gone on record stating he would sometimes work over 40 hours without sleep, only to go home and sleep for 4 hours and do it all again. Absolute insanity. Nintendo Wi-Fi Connection 
When it was announced that Super Smash Bros. Brawl for the Nintendo Wii would take advantage of the Wii's online service, called Nintendo Wi-Fi Connection, people lost their minds. The ability to play against anyone all over the world, it was a Smash player's dream, and unfortunately it kinda stayed a dream, and arguably still kind of is to this day. Nintendo's online offering left much to be desired, often being a laggy mess. On top of that, as it is the case today, you had to buy an aftermarket ethernet adapter if you wanted a more stable wired connection, which not many people do, resulting in a very disappointed audience. To their credit, though it's not perfect, Smash Ultimate's online, so long as both players either have a stable connection or are both on a wired connection, is leaps and bounds better than what we started with, so at least they're improving, even if you still get into a laggy game seemingly one in every four rounds. Sonic and Melee Rumor Even before Melee, rumors of characters being in Super Smash Bros. were everywhere. I remember going on supercheats.com sometime around 1999 or so and just reading endless user submissions about beating the game on very hard with one life as Jigglypuff or some other character that we thought was bad back then without using any continues and if you beat it you unlocked Goku or something. It was ridiculous. There were so many of these rumors so I guess it wouldn't be too surprising that famous gaming publication Electronic Gaming Monthly would jump on the rumor bandwagon and hint that there's a way to not just unlock Sonic in Melee, but Tails too. I mean, as a kid, I too also thought it was strange that there were seemingly two open character slots beneath Falco and Young Link, but deep down I knew there wasn't anything else available to unlock. That didn't stop EGM from trying though. They claimed that if you beat 20 or more enemies on Cruel Melee, which is very difficult to do, then completed a playthrough of Classic Mode, you'd go fight and unlock Sonic and Tails. The thing is, this was in the April issue of the magazine, so it was meant to be a joke, but the thing is, it was mixed in with a bunch of other facts that are real, such as playing as Fox or Falco on Corneria and calling the other Star Fox members, or holding a button to rearrange the trophies, and so on, so it's no wonder it was so convincing. Luckily, anyone who submitted proof that they beat 20 enemies in Cruel Melee to EGM got a free copy of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle on GameCube, and that game's fantastic, so I'd say that's fair. Grinch Leak The Grinch Leak was an elaborate hoax of a mural featuring what was supposedly every character that was to be featured in Smash Ultimate, as the entire roster had yet to be revealed yet. It featured characters such as Shadow, who I was very excited for and wanted very badly, as well as Banjo and Kazooie, the Chorus Kids from Rhythm Heaven, Gino from Super Mario RPG, Isaac from Golden Sun, Ken from Street Fighter, and Mock Rider from the NES game of the same name. Of course, two of these would become legitimate DLC fighters, which was awesome, but many people fell for this hoax as the poster seemed so legit. Oh, and if you're wondering why it's called the Grinch Leak, it's because to the side of the Smash mural in the picture, there's also an image of the Grinch from that Grinch movie by Illumination that came out in 2018. L Cancelling L Cancelling is another advanced move present only in the original Super Smash Bros. as well as Melee. Basically, if you press L, R, or Z seven frames before you land, you'll cut the landing lag in half, allowing for much quicker movement. Not much more to it than that, at least not that I can explain since I'm not a pro. So moving on. Brawl was delayed. Not a whole lot to say about this one. Basically, Brawl had a couple delays. The first delay was announced October 10th of 2007 alongside the announcement of Sonic joining the game, and was pushed from December 3rd, 2007 to January 24th of 2008 in Japan. The following day, it was announced that the game would be released February 10th, 2008. The game was once again delayed and finally would release in North America on March 9th, 2008. Smash 3DS Demo The 3DS demo for Smash 4 came out in North America on October 3rd, 2014 and allowed players to play as Mario, Link, Pikachu, Villager, and Mega Man. Players were only allowed access to one stage, and were allowed to play 30 times before the demo became inactive. Nothing much more to say about this one. Fighting Polygon Team 
The Fighting Polygon team was an enemy that appeared only during the single player mode of Super Smash Bros on the Nintendo 64. I remember as a kid, before unlocking Ness, I was unsure as to who the last character I was missing was, and me and my friends would try to get the Fighting Polygon team and get Ness to spawn to try to figure out who it was. We'd see the way he'd jump around and could never figure it out. Also, we'd never even heard of Earthbound at that age, so it's not like we would have guessed anyway. But regardless, the Fighting Polygon team would never appear in any future titles, at least not as of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. However, sometimes a similar enemy would appear that would take a similar role, like the Fighting Wireframes in Melee, or the Fighting Alloy team in Brawl, and so on. Smash Pro Player Pedophile Controversy so, I don't really want to use anyone's name in this point, mainly because time has passed since it happened, so new developments may have brought to light as to whether or not anyone involved was ultimately innocent or guilty, and even if guilty, I'd still rather not name those responsible. There are countless videos discussing this in depth, so if you want to look into it further, you're more than welcome to. I'm just going to explain what happened in short. Back in July of 2020, a surprisingly large number of professional Smash players were accused of engaging in sexual acts with minors, as well as many other instances of sexual misconduct in general. It was a big deal, and if you were into Smash at the time and actively online with the community in any way during July, you no doubt heard about it. Super Smash Bros. is the imagination of a child. There are entire theories about the whole secret lore behind Smash, involving the representations of Master Hand, Taboo, and the other boss characters exclusive to Smash and all that. And they dedicate their entire videos to discussing this background, but I'll try to summarize. Basically, in Smash 64, we see a child's bedroom in the opening cinematic as the hand, representing the child, grabs the doll and drops it on his desk, then proceeds to arrange the desk as an imaginary fighting ring that then transforms into a magical world of imagination. In Smash Melee, we see a room in the trophy gallery that's uh, much more mature looking and seemingly adult, and in the intro video, we see a hand grab a trophy, which, I mean, I guess the hand could belong to a kid, but the idea of the toy now being trophies as opposed to a ragdoll plush figures that I as a kid always interpreted as plushies, kind of hint at a more mature type of collectible, kind of like going from Walmart or Toys R Us toys to fine statues that cost hundreds of dollars. Then we have Smash Brawl, where Taboo is attempting to control Master Hand, which is metaphoric of Taboo, which of course as a word means forbidden, uh, attempting to stop Master Hand from doing what he enjoys because of societal norms. There are whole videos about this as I said, and I just gave a summary of a summary of a summary. So, if you want the whole thing laid out for you in explicit detail, there are quite a few great videos on the subject, but for now, on to the next. Amiibo Manufacturer Errors Amiibo have notoriously had some crazy manufacturer errors, from the two cannon armed Samus, to the headless Bowser, to the figure being upside down and not even attached to the base, it goes on and on. As time goes on, the quality control seems to have gotten quite a bit better, but still, it's really funny to see these, and some of them even ended up selling for quite a bit of money due to the absurdity of the error. Name Entry Glitch In Smash Melee, you can do a few strange things doing something called the Name Entry Glitch, which I'm not going to explain how to do here because I'm really bad at explaining things in a step-by-step -step sort of way, but trust me, you can find a bunch of tutorials just by searching Name Entry Glitch Melee. What this glitch does, however, is a few different things. You can play as Master Hand, you can use it to make your character have a shadow dark appearance, you can load into a stage with no opponent, play a match with a time of zero seconds, and probably even more than that. 20XX this refers to a joke made during a stream back in 2013 of a melee tournament hosted by the Big House, where commentator Chris Alexander describes that in the year 20XX, purposely ambiguous and stemming from the Mega Man series, everyone in the world will main Fox in melee, and becomes so good at Fox that everyone in the world plays him to theoretical perfection, to the point that skill is so equally matched that the only deciding factor to a victory is port priority in the console. So, 
the players will rock, paper, scissors to decide who gets port 1, and that will decide the outcome of the round without even actually playing. That's basically the whole gist of it, but if you're curious of what is affected by port priority in Smash, or what it even is, I looked into it, as I had no idea it influenced anything. But basically, if both players were to go for a grab or a jab at the exact same time, and the frames lined up one for one as they go for a grab, the ultimate deciding factor of who gets the grab or attack comes down to port priority, so whoever's player one will win out. Super Smash Bros. Brawl fanfic was once believed to be the longest piece of English literature. So, the fanfiction titled The Subspace Emissaries World Conquest is a story written by a guy named Christian, who goes by Aura Channeler Chris online. Last updated in 2018, it's currently at 4,102,328 words, which, for reference, all seven Harry Potter books combined have a total word count of 1,084,170 words. The Lord of the Rings trilogy, plus The Hobbit, just to uh, add to it a little bit, has a word total of 576,569 words. The King James Authorized Bible has 783,137 words, so that's just to put it into perspective. It would be pretty awesome to see this whole thing printed and bound in a single book, if it's possible. Also, the title of this point is Once Believed to be the Longest, and I tried doing some research to find what the current longest is, and I couldn't really find anything. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure if something has beaten it yet, but I still like to think it's this, because, you know, it's Super Smash Bros., so why not? Charles Martinet Charles Martinet has been the voice of Mario since 1992, and also voices Luigi, Wario, and Waluigi as well. He's done quite a bit of other voice acting jobs, but Mario is his most notable role. Smash 64 Final Smashes In an interview with Masahiro Sakurai and Satoru Iwata, Final Smashes were meant to be present from the very beginning, debuting in Smash 64, but due to the technical limitations of the console, were ultimately scrapped. There isn't really any word as to why they also skipped over them in Melee, but by the time Brawl came around, they'd be a mainstay of the series. New Probably the shortest entry on this entire iceberg. Simply put, in Smash 64, there's an unused stage in the debug menu that just says New, and when you access it, it's kind of like Dreamland, with the same background, but with very strange platform placement. There isn't really much to say beyond that though. It is strange though. Wobbling Wobbling is an exploit performed with the Ice Climbers. Basically, after grabbing an opponent and maintaining a constant rhythm of tapping the A button while holding down tilt, you can infinitely damage an opponent with no means of escape. Due to this, performing this is banned at basically all tournaments. Oh, and it's only possible in melee, by the way. Luigi and Samus's Missing Hitboxes In Super Smash 64, Luigi's dash attack and Samus's up air both have hitboxes that don't spawn at all. This was documented in a YouTube video posted by Mayro, and you can go check out his video where he fixes these hitboxes to work as intended. A very strange oversight, and one that he said was a very simple fix, which raises the question as to why Hal didn't just go ahead and fix them, but whatever. Meteor Smashes versus Spikes I'm not a professional player by even the slightest definition, so I'll do my best to explain this one. In Melee, there are two different kinds of downward hits that force an opponent down towards the blast zone, referred to as a Meteor Smash and a Spike. A Meteor Smash is a hit that sends you straight down, and can be cancelled by jumping or using up B. A spike, on the other hand, sends you downward but also at a slight angle and can't be responded out of until after the hit stun completes. Mario's forward air in melee, for example, is a meteor smash, since you can jump out of it, whereas Falco's down air is a spike and can't be cancelled. Debug Mode Only accessible from an action replay or Game Shark device, the debug menu allows you to set all sorts of parameters within the game. 
Some of these being the ability to change any fighter's size, and I'm not just saying the size is available with super mushrooms or poison mushrooms, there's quite a lot of variety in the different sizes you can make the fighters. You can also assign CPU behaviors similar to the way you can in training mode, but there are a lot more options here, such as Freak, whatever that may be. You can also assign them behaviors that are from event matches where they do specific things to fit the event. You can also choose any stage to fight on, as well as the stages used in event matches or adventure mode, so there's a lot here you can work with, and even more so if you're interested in all that, so check it out. SDI I'll do my best to explain this one because I really don't get it, so I think I got it, but here we go. SDI stands for Smash Directional Influence, and is a mechanic that allows you to slightly alter your position during the second hit lag frame by tapping the control stick in any direction, which will slightly move your character in that direction. This could be used effectively for getting out of multi-hit moves or combos. I don't really get it, but there you go. Mushroom Kingdom Danger Signs Another short and easy one, on the Mushroom Kingdom stage on Smash 64, if you pause the game and turn the camera to look towards the blast zones, you'll see danger signs. Fitting, of course, since you die if you go past them. So, yeah, danger indeed. Akania Akania is a stage that shows up in the debug menu for Smash Melee. It's been confirmed that it was meant to represent a Fire Emblem stage for Smash Melee, as the Fire Emblem characters don't have a home stage, but it was dropped from development. If you try to load the stage via the debug menu, the game will crash. That's about it for that one. Smash Bros Dojo The Smash Bros Dojo was a website that Nintendo used back during the development of Brawl. This site was where new updates on development, as well as the announcements of new characters, would be made. Mr. Game & Watch Can't L Cancel As the title suggests, for some reason Mr. Game & Watch is the only character from Smash Melee who can't L cancel. This is thought to be because he was the last character developed for the game, but really who knows, there isn't really anything else to say about this one, but it is strange that he'd be the only character that can't do that. Project M Project M is a fan mod for Brawl that, on top of speeding up the gameplay and removing tripping and overall making the gameplay much closer to Melee, has done many more exciting things like add custom costumes for fighters, and even added in new fighters entirely, even bringing back Mewtwo, Pichu, and Roy. Super Smash Bros. Fighter Ballot the Fighter Ballot was an official Nintendo ballot where you can vote for what characters you wanted to see in Smash 4. I personally submitted a ballot for Yuma Tato from the Sunsoft NES Famicom Classic Mr. Gimmick, and I'm like 99% positive I'm the only person who was really pushing for him in the game. And another ballot I submitted was for Shantae, who to this day I'd still love to see included. Oh, and uh, Shadow, but you know, he's a trophy. Smash 4 Soundtrack CDs The Smash 4 soundtrack was available for free to anyone who registered both the 3DS and Wii U versions of the game on Club Nintendo between the dates of November 21st, 2014 and January 13th of 2015. I remember doing this and I still have the CD to this day. The Pikachu in Brawl is the Pichu from Melee. Another interesting theory, this point suggests that the Pichu from Melee evolved into the Pikachu that's featured in Brawl. One of the main clues to this theory is that one of the skins for Pichu in Melee has goggles, and the same blue skin for Pikachu in Brawl has goggles as well. Furthermore, since Brawl Pikachu knows Volt Tackle, an attack that can only be learned in the Pokemon games via breeding to a Pichu, that pretty much makes it an open and shut case for most people, so yeah, I believe that one too. Seems pretty fun. Smash Wii U 50 Fact Extravaganza On October 23rd, 2014, the official Nintendo YouTube channel uploaded a video called Wii U Super Smash Bros. for Wii U 50 Fact Extravaganza, and is a 35 minute long video full of new updates and information about Smash 4 Wii U, especially updates and differences from the 3DS version. 3DS is a controller for Wii U. 
Not sure why this is a point on the iceberg, but I guess it is a bit strange, so why not mention it? In Smash 4 on the Wii U, you're allowed to use the 3DS as a controller. I guess that makes sense, as the controls between the 3DS and Wii U game are essentially the same. This was probably also great during the time the GameCube controller adapter was harder to come by, and no one owned more than one controller for the Wii U, so I bet it got its fair share of use. Green Shell Glitch In Smash 64, if you stack a bunch of green shells on top of each other, then perform an attack that does multiple hits of damage, like Mario's tornado attack, it'll cause the shells to infinitely hit each other, while also not moving. It also essentially locks the fighter within the area the shells are stacked, until the timer on the shells ends and they disappear. During the glitch, the game's audio will go crazy, and yeah, it's just a fun little glitch, so try it out. Chain Grabbing Chain grabbing is an exploit in which a character can continuously grab their opponent repeatedly, which of course leads to racking up huge amounts of damage. I'm not sure all the characters capable of doing this, but Marth in Melee is certainly a heavy offender of this ability. Ditto in Melee The Pokemon Ditto was meant to be featured in Melee, but was cut very late in development. As with most Pokemon, he was meant to be found in a Pokeball. Once appearing on stage, he would take on the appearance of whoever the player was who threw the Pokeball, and act sort of as a computer AI for a short time, then vanish like other Pokemon do. Ditto apparently also had an entry in the official Melee strategy guide, lending more evidence to its late removal from the game. Ditto can still be accessed with an action replay, but doesn't perform the intended action of mimicking a player, and instead jumps up and spins, then vanishes. Smash 64 Instant KO Animation so, I'm not entirely sure what this is for, but in Smash 64, every character has an unused animation that, upon activating, instantly kills them. Speculation for this generally concluded that it was meant to be for stage KOs, but really, it's entirely speculation. I personally think that maybe there was once intended to be a stamina mode in Smash 64, where all the characters start at a high percent and the point is to lower it to zero, then they'd instantly be KO'd as opposed to having to knock them into a blast zone, but again, that's just the even more speculation on my part. It's entirely up in the air. Banjo and James Bond Inclusion Rumor With the success of GoldenEye 007, as well as Banjo-Kazooie on the Nintendo 64, during the early stages of Melee, the idea of adding Banjo and James Bond himself to the game was actually considered. Like, I get Banjo, but James Bond? Insanity, I know. This insanity would reach Nintendo and make them come to their senses when they finally realized that not only would they need Rare's cooperation, which isn't the hard part, they would need the James Bond license, which would just be an absolute chore to obtain, as they'd need the right from Eon Productions, who owns the film rights to the franchise, as well as getting actor likeness approval, and so much more. I'm sure it was this short conversation that ultimately led to the agreement that all Smash characters should originate from games. Why any talks about Banjo being added stopped here are probably because of his license being bought by Microsoft, but it's nice to know that we now have the lovable bear in Smash after all these years. Meta Ridley's Inconsistent Heart so, basically this point is just referring to the fact that when fighting Meta Ridley in Brawl, if you zoom into her heart, the texture is a mess, not really representing anything that makes any sense, but if you examine her trophy and zoom into her heart, there's a fully textured heart that looks accurate. Funny that these kind of things get textured anyway, since it's not normally seen, but I guess that's Nintendo's eye for detail for ya. None. Within the debug menu for Melee, you can find a character file that reads chkind underscore none, or just none. Of course, attempting to launch any sort of game with this character will crash the game. Selecting this name for the results screen has some crazy results, cycling through a bunch of things before finally determining no contest. None is also in Brawl, and also features no fighter information associated with it. Cafe Verona Test Background 
A very strange stage found in Melee, simply called Test, can be found within the game using an action replay or the debug menu. Not sure how, but some speculate that the image in the background is a picture of a restaurant in Palo Alto, California, called Cafe Verona, which is now closed, so I guess we'll never really know unless whoever put the image into the game in the first place outright says so. Samus Unmasked Trophy A trophy of Samus Unmasked exists in Melee, but was only given out at special Japan-only events, so it's not possible to get currently, unless you hack it into the game with a Game Shark or Action Replay. I believe this is the first 3D appearance of Samus without her helmet on, at least to my knowledge. Besides that, though, there isn't a whole lot left to say about this one, just a small piece of Melee that I'm sure not many fans have ever seen given its rarity. Super Death Jump Short and simple, in Brawl, when playing stamina mode as Ike, if you have the flower, which slowly drains your health, and use up B just as you hit 0% and die, you'll fly in the air and take a surprisingly long time to come back down. It's pretty funny to see, but that's about it. 7-Eleven Leaks 7-Eleven stores are incredibly popular in Japan, and as such, Nintendo will use them for advertising, such as the case with Super Smash, which resulted in a few early leaks. I'm not entirely sure how these posters ended up leaking characters before they're announced by Nintendo. Maybe they got to the stores early and eager employees just put them up right away? But either way, so far these posters have led to the early announcements of Hero, Banjo, and Steve. Mario and Yoshi Trophy Similar to the Samus Unmasked Trophy, this was only given out at Japan-only events, so hacking is the only way to see it in your game nowadays. You know, I do wonder how these were handed out in the first place. Like, were people expected to bring their memory cards with them to some convention or whatever? Very strange. Anyway, moving on. Super Smash Bros. Masterpiece In Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, you can access a menu called Masterpieces that feature short demos of mini games that feature characters from Smash, such as the original Super Mario Bros., Super Mario World, Kid Icarus, Punch-Out, Ocarina of Time, Mega Man 2, and much much more. It is unfortunate that there's a timer for the games and you can only play them for a short time, but oh well, I guess that's to be expected. The point of this on the iceberg, however, is actually because in Smash 4, there was supposed to be a masterpiece for the original Super Smash Bros. on N64, meaning that since they don't carry over Ocarina of Time or Star Fox 64's masterpieces from Brawl, there's no 64 masterpieces in Smash 4. Oh well. LOZ18 Leaks LOZ18 was a GameFAQ forum user who posted many leaks that early on were considered hoaxes that ended up becoming true, most notably him stating that Smash Ultimate would feature every character from all previous Smash games. His info was widely considered fake until Nintendo's E3 2018 Everyone Is Here trailer dropped, and everyone then considered him a highly legitimate source, until later he made countless statements that were wrong, such as Isabel not being in the game, and constantly confirming then denying characters joining, such as Isaac from Golden Sun, who he said would, and would not be in the game multiple times. It was eventually concluded that his initial prediction was a fluke, and he faded into obscurity and fled into the night. Captain Falcon's Gun Captain Falcon has a gun, and really that's all there is to this point. He has a gun and he never uses it. So uh, yeah, that's it. Smash Bros. Universe Rumor after Smash 4 was announced, a fake image was circulated that showed a logo for a title called Super Smash Bros. Universe, stylized so that the U in Universe looked like the Wii U logo. You know, to look all legit and all that. Seems like a fun way to utilize the U aspect of the Wii U. This was all eventually debunked as just another lovely Smash hoax. Subspace is canon. I mean, yeah, why wouldn't it be? I don't really understand this point, as I feel that the story for Smash is exactly that, it's the story that takes place within the game, so why wouldn't it be canon? I mean, like, I don't think it's canon to Mario or Sonic in their respective universes, but in the Smash universe I think it's canon to 
Smash. Uh, this apparently stems from the fact that when Rob is being played on Little Mac's boxing arena stage, his title, or whatever you want to call it, says the last of his kind, which he is in Subspace Emissary's story, but like, okay. What else are they going to put there? Pilot of Great Fox? The Great Pack-In Wonder? The Stacker of Stack-Up? The Spinner of Gyros? I don't know. But given that he has no real prominence in any game outside of Smash, I don't see why it's such a big deal to make his title something from the game that gave him the most personality. And furthermore, I don't think that makes or breaks whether or not Subspace is canon, because of course it is. It's, you know, Smash is its own series, so yeah, it's canon within Smash. 3D Flying Man Model in the Earthbound or Mother stage Magicant, the Flying Man enemies will appear on the stage and will assist a fighter who walks past them. Originally, the game was going to have a 3D modeled Flying Man character, but ultimately went with a 16-bit style sprite designed more closely to resemble their appearance in Earthbound or Mother 2 or whatever. Brawl Visual Damage Effect during Brawl's development, the idea to implement battle damage as a character takes more percent was to be included, but was ultimately scrapped. This would include weapons and clothing getting roughed up, like Link's Hylian shield or Captain Falcon's helmet getting cracked and scraped. Not sure why this was scrapped, but I personally think it would have been cool, but if I'm to guess, maybe a visual representation of the characters getting injured is a bit too much and may have affected the ESRB rating. Who knows? Kirby says Jigglypuff's Japanese name. When Kirby has Jigglypuff absorbed, it's speculated that Kirby says Jigglypuff's Japanese name put in when performing rollout, but honestly, I really don't hear it, so I I don't think so, but maybe. Mr. Game & Watch is a Smash original character. This point is basically referring to the fact that Game & Watch as a name simply refers to the handheld Game & Watch Nintendo games that came out in the early 80s, and that Mr. Game & Watch himself isn't actually a character within these titles, as all of his attacks stem from different games in the Game & Watch library, and he's simply utilizing all of them as his attacks. It's not like within those games he was ever referred to as Mr. Game & Watch, it was only given to him in Melee. Super Smash Bros. is the biggest crossover in history. I mean, yeah, it's pretty up there. I can't think of any other crossover that has more unique characters from other companies, but the thing I feel that will really bring Smash into being a crossover beyond all others is when they start introducing characters that have never been on a Nintendo platform. I know Master Chief is a popular choice, and that would certainly be an excellent addition, if only to break the formula of the characters appearing on Nintendo consoles. Joker was close, but Persona itself has been on Nintendo consoles before, so not quite. Either way, it's still very impressive, I just can't stress how awesome it would be to get characters who have never appeared on Nintendo consoles to be featured in Smash. I'd even count Spyro, even though technically he did have a game on Game Boy Advance alongside a sister game with Crash Bandicoot. What would really be awesome would be if we got Ratchet and Clank, or Sly Cooper or something, since they've yet to appear on a Nintendo console. I can't stress how much breaking that barrier would really put Smash into a whole nother level. Crash and Burn Though not implemented, Crash and Burn was to be a bonus given at the end of a round in Adventure Mode in Melee, awarded to those who miss attempted Meteor Smash attacks, giving minus 500 points. Since this point is so short, I'll mention the other removed bonuses. We've got Barrel Blast KO, giving 300 times points for using a barrel to KO an opponent. Deflector, which gives 1000 points, but doesn't have a description. Green Shell Shooter, giving 800 times for causing damage twice or more with a green shell. Red Shell Shooter, for 400 times points for causing damage 3 or more times with a red shell. Pool Shark, for 300 times points for throwing an enemy into another enemy and Ricochet Rifler for 800 times points for deflecting a shot and having it hit an enemy. Smash is Autistic 
This is referring to a YouTube video in which user Loxton and Noggin explains over a 22 minute video that the concept of Super Smash Bros tells, in a way, a story of someone with autism. It sort of takes up after the whole Smash is in the mind of a child deal, as well as the whole theory about Smash 64 being about a kid, and as the games go on that kid gets older, but along with that, the kid is autistic. It goes over very many points that are very convincing, and I enjoy the video very much, so please go watch it. Personally, I don't think anyone at Nintendo ever mentioned autism once a single time during Smash's development, but either way, finding theories like these are always fun, and who knows, it could always be a more subconscious thing by Sakurai or something. Pramai There are several empty character files located within Brawl's data, suggesting that characters like Roy, Mewtwo, Dr. Mario, and new characters like Dixie Kong were planned at least at some point in development for files to be created. One file is named Pramai, which some have theorized to be for Plusle and Minin from Pokemon Gen 3, since in Japanese, phonetically spelled, Plusle is Prasa, and Minin is Mainan. I've also seen Plusle phonetically spelled as Prasir, so really, who knows? I don't think it's completely out of the question though, since Gen 3 was the new gen at the time, and they were seen as mascot characters since they resembled Pikachu so much, so it's a possibility. Me bullying. So apparently in Smash 4, the reason why Mii's aren't allowed to be used online is because Sakurai thought Mii's would be used for bullying? I have no idea what he could mean by this, like, you could make offensive Mii's? Is, is that what he's getting at? Or like, you and your friends could make a me of someone you don't like and beat it up? I really don't get it, and apparently Sakurai changed his mind because now Mii's are playable online in Smash Ultimate, so, I don't know. Space Jumps Another quick and simple one, in Subspace Emissary, when playing with two players, the Space Jump can be used in order to have Player 2 instantly transport, or Space Jump I guess, immediately to wherever Player 1 is, regardless of obstacles in the way. I guess it's like, if you're playing with your younger sibling who's like, dumb or something, they can easily just keep up with you because you're a pro gamer and they're not. 2L84 4 M E. In Melee, the barrel cannon items have 2L84ME written on the bottom of them, which of course translates from Leet Speak to Too Late for Me. Not really sure why it says that, or what the meaning of it is, but there you go. Charmander says Gummy Bears in Smash 64. In the Saffron City stage in Smash 64, occasionally a Pokemon will pop out and perform an action. When Charmander pops out, he, as most Pokemon do, says his name, then proceeds to use Flamethrower. The strange thing is, it doesn't really sound like he says Charmander. I thought maybe this was due to the N64 compression, but no, even in a clear uncompressed sample, it still sounds like, well, I don't know what it sounds like, but some people think it sounds like he says Gummy Bears, which is funny, but who really knows? I mean, listen for yourself and see. It definitely doesn't sound like Charmander though, at least I, he definitely isn't saying Gummy Bears, plural, because there's definitely no S sound at the end, so maybe just Gummy Bear? But anyway, moving on. Galeem and Darkon's Origins Not really sure if this is from a story standpoint or development standpoint, but either way, it's both a mystery regardless. They're very strange, abstract beings, and likely were just made to be as such, but of course, as it always goes, there are theories that touch upon them being a bit more. So, that of course leads us to Game Theory, who has a 20 minute long video discussing the representation of Galeem and Darkon, and their place in the Super Smash Bros. universe. Galeem represents Nintendo, and... Darkon represents the fans. Sorry, I don't know why this is a singular point on its own, because I feel it would get touched upon in the previous point, but I'll continue on here. Basically, Galeem is a creative force behind the game, with the army of master hands representing the developers and creators, and Darkon and the crazy hands represent the fans and their personal desires for the games to be made the way they want them to be. It's all a lot to get into, so you can just go check out the video describing it all. It's all very interesting, so yeah, check that out. Yellow Pikachu and Jigglypuff Alt Costumes 
For some reason in Smash 64, Pikachu and Jigglypuff both have a yellow colored variant alongside their green, blue, and red counterparts. However, the costumes themselves aren't accessible. All that remains is the stock icon that has Pikachu with a yellow hat and Jigglypuff with a yellow bow. Kirby is the strongest Smash Bros character. I think this is referring to the fact that within the powers of all the characters in Smash, Kirby is technically the most powerful. Some even go as far as to say he's the most powerful fictional character ever made and like, okay, but you can say that about so many characters and discussions like this are so pointless because it could just go on and on. It's like people who say, oh, no one can beat Goku, then someone will say, oh, Saitama can beat Goku because blah blah, and then someone will say, oh, well, 100% aware Haruhi Suzumiya could technically beat them both because she can choose what the universe is, but then like, okay, Maruka Kaname is an omnipotent concept and manifestation of hope, so she can't even be defeated because she can't die because she doesn't exist in a physical realm. And it just goes on and on. Anime characters, video game characters, they're all broken and OP. That's really all I have to say about that. It's, it's just an endless cycle. Peach Assault Rifle Texture For whatever reason, in Brawl, when going through Peach's files, a small icon of an assault rifle was found. Of course, there's no explanation, but still, what a strange inclusion for a Nintendo game. Kirby GCN Models as Brawl Trophies During E3 of 2005, Nintendo showed off a Kirby game for the GameCube that would never end up being released. Some of the models from this game would be reused for some of the assist trophies that featured Kirby characters in Brawl. So, um, I came this far, and there's no Rainbow Village point on this iceberg? That was the whole point of doing this iceberg. I said in the Super Mario 64 iceberg video that Rainbow Village didn't belong there, and that it belonged over here, but where is it? Well, there's nothing. Yeah. The village is there, but no one really talks about it. Whether some of you care or not, there's nothing really creepy about the Smash Iceberg. No personalization, no Wario apparition, no Aria or dead game developers' spirits hiding within, so hopefully that wasn't too anticlimactic for you. And that was the Super Smash Bros. Iceberg. As a bit of a throwaway line that was really meant as a joke, I really did want to continue making videos of some sort that would be entertaining. As I had mentioned, I didn't expect my Super Mario 64 video to get attention really. I mean, maybe a little just because it's Super Mario 64, so a video about a popular game is bound to get stumbled upon somehow, but really, it's quite amazing. I still continue to make these videos for my small group of friends, but the fact that I have nearly 4,000 individuals out there that enjoy the videos I've made, despite my amateur video and editing skills, really means a lot, and wow, nearly 4,000 people. To put that into perspective, that's more people than students at the high school I went to in Los Angeles County. That is a lot of people, so thank you everyone, really, truly, thank you. I'm thinking the next video will be Pokemon, whether it just be Gen 1 and 2, or the whole franchise, I'm not really sure yet, but after that, I don't really know. I don't have to keep doing icebergs, I wouldn't mind doing videos on anything, so if you've got suggestions of what you'd like to see, throw them out there in the comments, because I'd really like to know. This channel's fresh, and it can really go in any direction. Anyway, thanks again, sorry this video took so long to come out, and I hope you have a swell day.